You're listening to the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. So moving on to our next topic, Daryl, there may be some up-and-coming umpires watching this discussion and may be unsure about how to go about certain things within umpiring. So for our next discussion of this discussion, for our next topic, I should say, of this discussion, let's talk about the fundamentals of umpiring and give some tips and advice to any umpire who may be struggling and need some guidance. So let's talk about preparation, Daryl. It's very important to prepare as an umpire. We've got to prepare in everything in life. Um, as a player, as an umpire, you need to prepare before a game or a series, making sure you read the laws and the playing conditions for whatever series or competition you are umpiring. Speaking to your partner the night before who you may be umpiring the game with, talking about laws and playing conditions, sharing information on players, teams, um, conditions, grounds. Um, and Daryl, I came across a document which you did for the ICC um, in preparation for a World Cup match in 2011 in Chittagong. And you talked about how you prepared, you were working with um, preparing with the ground staff, you know, getting the you know, the certain, um, you know, getting the, the balls ready because there was a bit of dew that was going to come during the game and the ground staff were ready with mops and ropes to uh, in the second innings for, for the dew, obviously, to when it, when it came in. Um, you were talking about your exchanges with Graham Swan in that game because it was England versus uh, Bangladesh in Chittagong. Yes. And yeah. um, you were talking about your exchanges with Graham Swan. He was saying, I can't bowl with this ball. Uh, you said, we'll give it to someone else who can. <laughs> um, and you were talking about how we planned to change the ball after 21 and 30 overs due to the surfy nature of the, of the outfield and, and that, yeah. um, talking about that and preparing for that. So, Daryl, how important was it to do that preparation in that World Cup match? And how did you go preparing before games or a series during your time as an international umpire? And what advice would you give on any up and coming umpire on preparation? Well, there's a couple of different aspects to it. I mean, if it's an international match uh, and you've got a, a partner, uh, you've generally umpired with them before, you all, you're always spending time in the days leading up to the game, talking about all the different aspects and covering, trying to cover all the possibilities that could happen. I think in that case in Bangladesh, in Chittagong, in 2011, I have a hunch that that might have been the very first one-day international that had ever been played in Chittagong uh, as a day-nighter. I think they'd played on that ground, well, I know they'd played on that ground many times before, but a day-nighter was a different proposition because at the change of innings, it was almost as if someone had come out and hosed down the ground. It was, the dew factor was just enormous. And we were, we were alerted to that by the ground staff. They told us what to expect. We did have a lot of balls uh, available. Uh, in those days, I believe we had a mandatory change of ball after 35 overs, 34, yes, 35 yes, overs. that's correct, yeah. But, but on this occasion in, uh, in Chittagong, we knew that the ball was going to be out, out of condition much earlier than that. So uh, I was umpiring with Rod Tucker, and I seem to recall that um, Graham Swan was bowling the seventh over of a 50 over match when he it was complained the eighth to the, over, actually. That the was eighth the, over? Okay. Yeah, eighth over. Yeah. It, I knew it was pretty early, uh, a yeah. single digit. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I, I just, uh, I suppose I, I took the hard line. I could imagine that if I changed the ball in the eighth over, I'd be changing it again in the 10th, the 12th, the 15th, and so on. We'd run out of balls. There wouldn't be enough balls around. No, we had to be fair to both teams. Um, you have to deal with the conditions that you're confronted with. There was a reason why Bangladesh won the toss and fielded because they knew there would be a Jew. And I'm sure without checking any records, they probably just had the mandatory ball change after 34, 35 overs. And they, I think they bowled England out for 225-ish, somewhere around about that mark. And when England came out and uh, it was quickly obvious that, um, you know, the ball was going to be... Uh, wet very quickly and become soapy. That's the time that it's very hard to grip. Uh, but I couldn't envisage changing the ball after eight overs. After it had been used for seven, 
at the start of the eighth over. It just wasn't going to happen. So, uh, yeah, I, I remember Graham being quite irate about the fact that um, I wouldn't automatically change it because he, he wanted it. Um, we did exchange a few words. I thought it was a reasonable answer when he told me that he couldn't bowl with that effing ball. I just suggested he give it to someone that could. Um, it seemed straightforward to me. Um, that's basically uh, leads on me on to the other question you ask about preparation for an umpire. I think an umpire should always ensure that he is his natural self. If, if, you, if you have a sense of humour and that works for you, then you use it. Dealing with people. It's the same in any walk of life, in business, uh, in education, um, walking up and down the street. I mean, if, if, you, if you're a people person, then you use those skills. If you're not, you don't. So my, my main piece of advice to any up-and-coming umpire would be to be themselves. Don't try and impersonate another umpire. Don't try and copy someone else's style or mannerisms. But be natural, be, be yourself. And uh, that's something that I always uh, try to ensure. Um, and I think that that's got me through a lot of uh, very difficult situations over a, a long uh, career of over 830 games of cricket. So, yeah, be natural, be relaxed. And when someone gets upset, like Graham Swan did, don't get upset as well. It doesn't, it doesn't help the situation if two people are, are aggressive. Just try and be a calm uh, or a calming influence on, this, on the situation. And because, you know, those moments will occur in, in your cricket career. There'll be times when people aren't happy with you, whether it be the captain, the batsman, the bowler, fieldsman. Um, you've just got to deal with it in a professional and calm manner, um, if you can. That's right. Uh, the important message here, just be yourself, you know, just be natural exactly. and just have fun, really enjoy yeah. the job. It's, it's a job, but it's, it's the best job in the world. It is. Um, so routines are very important for umpires, Daryl. You've got to have a good routine or rituals, sure. as we call them. Yeah. Um, every umpire has a different routine that, that they follow pre-game, during the game and post-game. There's no set routine that each umpire follows. Uh, routines come um, in different shapes and forms. Daryl, how important is it as an umpire to have a good routine? And what was your routine when you umpired? What was my routine? Well, I mean, routine, you have uh, so many different routines in a day. It's, it, you know, you, you can't nominate them. Let's just pick one. One would be uh, counting, counting the balls in the over. Every, every umpire is out there with a, a counter of some type. Um, David Shepherd used to have little toy beer barrels. I think they were Watney's beer barrels, about the size of a 10 cent coin, 20 cent coin, something, something of that nature. Um, other umpires I've seen have six stones in their hand and they transfer one stone across to the other hand or he would put his little beer barrel across and pop it in his pocket. But you need to set yourself up with a routine and often it's decided or determined very early in your career because it's what you just do instinctively on the first game. When do you count the delivery? Do you count the delivery as the bowl is about to deliver the ball? After he's delivered the ball? When the ball's dead? When? And, and every umpire would have their own mannerism or a way of doing it. Um, I'm thinking back to when I was umpiring, I would actually be pressing my counter as the bowler was in his delivery stride. And if he delivered a no ball, then of course, I'd have to recalculate. I'd have to go back, um, depending on the type of counter I had and, and, and get it accurate again. If it was a wide or a no ball, it would, would take a bit of a checking. And you've always got your partner out at square leg. Uh, generally speaking, most will signal to you, not just necessarily with two to go. Some umpires will signal when there's three to go. Some umpires will signal immediately after a uh, an extra delivery, for example, if there's been a no ball or a wide and you've just given two to go before that delivery, there's obviously still another two to go. So the umpire will, will look at each other again and give the two to go signal. They'll repeat that because there's still two to go. So whatever ritual or habit you come up with, it's a matter of maintaining it and letting it become second nature. And as a result, you'll have very very few slip-ups. I'm not saying you'll be per perfect because none of us have been, 
uh, I don't know of an umpire that's uh, ever umpired who hasn't miscounted at some stage or another. It, it, it will happen. It's a game played by humans, umpired by humans. There will be, there will be errors involved. We accept that. We just like to try and keep them to a minimum. Absolutely. Um, focus and concentration is a big thing, Daryl. Concentrating for long periods of time are very important for an umpire. And you have to master that. Uh, just like the players, umpires need good focus and concentration during a game. Um, we cannot fully focus for long periods of time, like in a test match. You can't concentrate for six hours straight. Um, just doesn't happen that way. So you need to find ways and strategies to switch on, switch off, or switch up, sure. or switch down in between balls, uh, just to relax your mind and reset and refocus for the next delivery. Um, so, Daryl, during your international career, you have umpired in some games where big crowds were involved in lots of noise and distractions. So, Daryl, what was your method in dealing with all those distractions and what advice would you give to any up-and-coming umpire on how to improve their focus and concentration? Well, first of all, you don't need to concentrate for very long at all. You know, in a, in a, in a day's play with, let's say, 90 overs, um, when you're at the bowler's end for 45 overs, um, what's that, 270 deliveries? Uh, it's, it's not a huge amount, but you're not focused all the time. You're not concentrating all the time. When the ball becomes dead, you go into a different mode. You, you, you're not stressed. You might be watching the ball go back, relayed through, through, the, through the fielder. Back. You, don't, you don't see it necessarily go back to the bowler because he's behind you, but you sense when he's about to start his run-up, and that's when you start to switch your focus back on. So you're only really focusing for four or five seconds at a time, 270 times a day at the bowler's end. It doesn't amount to a huge amount. But what you've got to do is you've got to ensure that when you do switch on, you switch on fully and you don't let anything distract you. Because um, if you can get it, if you're in a partway through a conversation and a ball's bowled, it can be distracting if you've got your mind somewhere else or you're thinking about home or you're thinking about the kids or you're thinking about you know, what your friends are up to or you're thinking about those people over in the crowd enjoying watching and having a beer and you're not. Um, it's, it's all a matter of just focusing for a small period of time, get it right, then relax. You might have a word to the non-striker. You might speak to the bowler as he walks past. You might tell him that he's very close to the front of the popping crease. You might uh, be having a conversation about someone's private life. Uh, you might be talking about one of his teammates. Uh, Gautam Gambia for India used to come down to the bowler's end and ask me about his batting technique. Did I get my front foot across far enough, Daryl? Where was that pitch, Daryl? Did I have that one covered, Daryl? Yes, Gautam. Yes, Gautam. You know, you're looking good. Keep it up. Um, so there are a lot of things that can distract you, but it's all a matter of turning those off and focusing for four or five seconds until the action's finished. Absolutely. Um, training is very important for umpires as well, Daryl. Going down to the nets, it's where you fine tune your processes, methods, routines, technique, working on different skills, building rapport with the players. And you've certainly done that over your time as an international umpire, Daryl, going down to the nets, building rapport with the players, have a chat with them, seeing sure. different batsmen, different bowlers on both teams. Um, so, Daryl, what did you do in the nets in the lead up to matches and how should up and coming umpires approach training? Okay, well, I, I would never go into the nets for a long period of time. Half an hour would be uh, probably the, the maximum time I'd spend down there. I'd be looking for any bowlers that I hadn't seen before. If there was someone new in the squad who might appear in the game, uh, this is more likely to happen in an ODI than a test match. But um, the same would happen uh, for any game if there was someone new. I'd want to see where they bowled from. Uh, I'd want to see if they were close to the pop increase, if they were running down the pitch. Um, strangely enough, uh, most times in the nets, if you told a bowler that he just bowled a no ball, he'd say, oh, don't worry about it. I'll get it right in the game. Um, bowlers tend to be a little bit lazy, or they did in the past in their training routines, and they always seem to believe that they had control of where their front foot was going to land when match day came. Uh, it didn't always happen, though. Um, so uh, I used to treat it as a, as, a, as a good occasion to catch up, to meet new people and to prepare for 
uh, the competition that was about to start because I wanted to be on a, on a good footing with as many people as possible. Absolutely. Um, so then we come into game day, Dale, and all the preparation and training and practice comes into uh, practice on game day. So, Daryl, how important is it to back your processes, preparation and training leading into a game on game day? Well, it's just it's all one package, Jack, really. Um, you know, if you prepare well, if you know your, your laws and your playing conditions, um, if you've got a good relationship with your partner and you've got confidence in your partner, uh, confidence in the third umpire, if you know what the fourth um, where the fourth umpire is going to be situated if you need them, you just... You just put all those pieces of the package together to get the finished product, and the finished product should be an efficient and hopefully non-controversial day of cricket where you aren't the focus. You want to get through that game without anyone noticing you, that you're there, apart from your family if they're watching on TV. Um, so, yeah, there's no one specific aspect that uh, you focus more on than another. It's really a combination of doing all the little things correctly in order, speaking appropriately and responding to the pressures and the stresses at the, in the right way. Absolutely. Um, self-reflection and self-analysis is very important for an umpire, Daryl, to reflect after a day's play or after a game or a series, as you would have done in your career. Um, you need to look to get better and improve as an umpire because basically that's the job. You want to get better at it. Sure. Um, you always want to look to learn and ask advice from other colleagues and peers so Daryl how did you go about reflecting after a game or a series and what other things umpires should be looking at when they reflect after a game well when I first started umpiring first class cricket there was very little television coverage so there wouldn't be a replay available for me to, to look at at home or in the umpires room there wouldn't it wasn't a tv set there so it was all a matter of doing the best job you could do if you got another game then obviously you'd done well enough to keep people happy. You didn't get much feedback, to be honest. The next appointment was your feedback. If you didn't get another appointment, okay, you offended someone or you got a couple of decisions wrong, obviously. These days, with so much footage available, there's no excuse for not going back and looking at the key moments in the day. And in a day's test match, there might only be six deliveries that you really need to go back and focus on. Generally speaking, they're going to be LBW appeals, might be a court behind, might be a run out, but the whole day can be brought down to just a couple of minutes of replays, uh, focus on what you think you saw, and uh, with, the per with the benefit of slow motion, you can see what, what you were trying to see, uh, what you perhaps didn't see correctly, and you can move forward and, and just prepare yourself for the battle the next day. Um, Yes, self-reflection is very important. You can't take anything for granted. And of course, for a lot of my career and my international career, we, we had uh, referees who would be uh, assessing each, each decision, each delivery. Um, and if we made an error, they would certainly tell us. I've got a feeling that if we got it right, they didn't say anything. Um, so yeah, there was always someone there. And of course, we'd always confer with the third umpire because you know, you'd, we'd, you'd always feel that the third umpire was your your closest colleague that wasn't on the field with you. And uh, if you had trust and uh, a good relationship with that person, then he told you you did something wrong, well, you'd accept that and try and do it better the next day. Absolutely. Um, Decision-making is very important, Cricket Daryl, as an umpire. Um, you have to be ready when the fielding team appeals to make your decision. But yeah. decision-making doesn't occur when a fielding side appeals. It happens every ball of the match. Um, Daryl, everyone expects umpires to get it all right, but we don't. We're not perfect. Um, but umpires need to develop methods and strategies to move on from bad decisions and focus on the next one. Mm -hmm. um, and also trusting your gut instinct as well, uh, which you did in 1999-2000 during that test match against India and Australia, where you gave Sachin Tendulkar out. You trusted your instincts and backed yourself to give him out, and you did. So, Daryl, what tips would you give to umpires about decision-making and how important is it to trust your instincts as an umpire when it comes to decision-making and what are your memories from that day at Adelaide when you gave such an out LBW? Yeah, well, it was quite a remarkable day, actually. Uh, I think India was set uh, 395 to win on the 
uh, in their second innings. And they started that on the fourth afternoon. Um, at three for 27, they were in a bit of trouble chasing 395 when Sachin walked in and uh, faced a couple of balls from Glenn McGrath. And uh, when the uh, particular delivery you're talking about came along, um, I, I didn't do anything different that I'd do any other occasion. I prepared myself to watch, you know, obviously, the front foot, watch where the ball was pitched and whatever action took part took place in front of me. And uh, on, the, on, the, on that occasion, I determined that uh, Sachin uh, had tried to duck under a bouncer, obviously, a bouncer that didn't bounce high, very high, uh, was hit on the shoulder. And um, I determined that he was uh, in front of the stumps and the ball would have gone on and, and, and clipped the stumps, not just the bales, but would have hit the top of the stumps. So um, I didn't do anything remarkable. I just gave him out. Um, it wasn't until he'd taken about 10 steps that I realised the enormity of what had just happened, that uh, this was the Indian captain at the time. Um, India was four for 27, chasing 395. Um, I knew that a lot of my friends would tell me, and they later did, that they'd come along to watch Sachin bat, not me umpire. But uh, you do what you need to do. Um, if someone gets hit in front of the stumps and you think the ball's going to hit them and it's pitched in the right place, well, uh, there wasn't there wasn't really any hesitation in my mind because uh, it was the only decision I could make. Um, what I didn't discover, uh, uh, but by the way, pe people have told me that's very controversial, but um, I I've never seen it that way. Um, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago I discovered that uh, Richie Benno uh, was actually off air at the time. He would have been off air preparing for the post-match or post-day's play uh, summary. But when he came back on air the following day, he said something to the effect that, uh, and then there was Tendulkar, and that was controversial. Well, it was made to be controversial, but from all the pictures I've seen, uh, that ball had reached its highest point and was not going to pass over the top of the stumps. I, I wish I'd known that on the day, but um, I didn't find out for about 16, 17 years. It made me feel a lot better, but unfortunately, Richie had left us by then. Um, um, most, most people agree he was a pretty good judge. He uh, spoke at the right times and what he said was made sense. And uh, I think what he said that on the fifth day of that match when he made that comment made sense. And um, hopefully when I've published my book, uh, you'll see a series of photos that will confirm there was absolutely no doubt that ball was going to hit the stumps. Absolutely. I have seen a video on YouTube of that. And um, it did look like it was going to hit the stumps. And in the end, you made the right decision. You backed yourself, which is very important as an umpire. Just trust your instincts. And if you get it right, that's great. If you get it wrong, so be it. Yeah. You don't get a lot of time to think. That's right. Um, so, Daryl, umpires will have to deal with players who are a bit naughty, a bit, you know, difficult to deal with, um, conflict, managing players is very important. Um, Often umpires will come in to defuse the situation or, you know, separate the players if they are, you know, exchanging words and that. So, Daryl, what advice would you give to umpires in dealing with conflict in a game? Well, I think the conflict, the physical conflict, certainly happens in, in the lower levels, the, the, the lower levels of cricket. That um, It's something that I re really, I didn't ever need to get involved in because... Most of the um, conflict in, at my level, my international level, was just, it was just a few verbal jibes, a, a, a comment here and a comment there. No one ever came to blows. There was never any physical contact. Um, but I'm always in, I, I've watched cricket at lower levels. In fact, I watched a game in 2011 between the Staten Island team and the team from Brooklyn. I think they might have been called the Brooklyn Lions. Most of them had come from Jamaica and were living in New York. And um, I felt quite embarrassed watching the game because every batsman that was given out or got out gave the umpire his, a piece of advice as he left. And they, they weren't very polite. It wasn't the sport that I knew uh, because I'd never had to deal with, with that sort of verbal aggression in the face of the umpire. I mean, no one ever spoke to me rudely like that. Um, and uh, I, I suppose it was partly the fact that baseball has a, a, a certain... Uh, aspect of it or an element of it that that it in, almost requires people to be aggressive uh people 
people seem to enjoy, the managers seem to enjoy giving the umpires uh, a difficult time and they're often kicked out of the game. Well, that's not going to happen in cricket. But that maybe that was the overriding influence in Staten Island um, on that particular day. Um, by the way, Staten Island Cricket Club was formed in 1872, which was uh, five years before the first test was ever played. So there has been cricket in some interesting parts of the world uh, for a long, long time. Uh, and I can proudly say I'm a member of the Staten Island Cricket Club. Absolutely. Um, Daryl, what advice would you give to any young umpire starting out? Play for as long as you can. Play the game for as long as you can. Get to know the game, the ins and outs. Know what it feels like to get a bad decision. <laughs> uh, know what it feels like to make a few runs, take a catch and take wickets. Just, you know, you play for the love of the game. If at the same time you can delve into the umpiring area, go for it, uh, which is basically what I did. Uh, those carnivals I umpired in as a 17, 18 year old, I couldn't have played in them. I'd been in them when I was too old. I had some time on my hands. I wanted to put my foot in the water and just see if I could enjoy it. And I did, I loved it. So volunteer, umpire some junior games, umpire the kids where there are less sheep stations involved. Um, uh, yeah, just take any opportunity to get out there and see if your, your judgment is as good as it needs to be to conduct a game uh, harmoniously, correctly and efficiently. Um, make sure everyone's having a great time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry? Go for it. Yeah, that's right. Go for it. I, I play an umpire myself where I'm from um, in the country and I enjoy it. You know, if I'm not playing one week, I can go and umpire a game and learn about the craft and get better yeah. at it. Yep, exactly. That's what it's all about. We, you exactly learn right. Exactly yeah. right. So Daryl, hi everyone. Hope these tips that Daryl Harper gave on umpiring will help you on your umpiring journey. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell to get the latest episodes of the podcast, and like and share our Facebook page, and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Also, the podcast is now available on Anchor, Spotify, and on Apple Podcasts. Until next time, keep safe and bye for now.